Good morning. <laughs> My name is Jamie Richards, and I'm a park ranger with the U.S. National Park Service at Joshua Tree National Park. It has been a great honor to be with all of you this week to celebrate and enjoy the 8th World Ranger Congress. This week, we have come together as a community of rangers to talk about the challenges and the opportunities that are facing rangers all across the world. This week, we've been discussing serious challenges like climate change and global warming. In 2012, the Association of National Park Rangers placed a bid to host the 8th World Ranger Congress in the United States to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the NPS Centennial. The National Park Service Centennial is a celebration for all rangers. It is a time to reflect upon the success we have had as a community in protecting the natural and cultural treasures across the world. It is also time for us all to think about the work we still have yet to accomplish and the opportunities that we have to engage the next generation of both park visitors and park rangers. The National Park Service Centennial is a celebration for all of us, from rangers deep in the Amazon rainforest to the coast off the Great Barrier Reef, from rangers in the Serengeti to San Francisco Bay. We speak a common language and we are united by a common bond, the bond of conservation. Joining us today to talk more about the MPS Centennial and what it means for all of us is the director of the U.S. National Park Service, Jonathan Jarvis. Jonathan Jarvis has spent the last 40 years working to preserve and protect America's natural and cultural treasures. He began his career as a seasonal interpretive ranger in Washington, D.C. Over the last 40 years, Director Jarvis has worked in interpretation, law enforcement, resource management, and park management. To learn more about the MPS Centennial and what this celebration and this milestone means for each and every one of us and all rangers across the globe, please join me in welcoming the Director of the U.S. National Park Service, Jonathan Jarvis. Uh, th <clears throat> Thanks, Jamie. And thank all of you for uh, traveling from far parts of the world and uh, around the country uh, to be here today. It's a real honor for me uh, to join all of you um, for the World Ranger Conference. A lot of old friends in the audience, a lot of new friends to be made, a lot of great folks here, uh, really excellent. Um, and thank you, Jamie, um, as well. So as Jamie said, um, 2016, the National Park Service, the U.S. National Park Service is 100 years old, and uh, I will have served for 40 of those years. So I have a few observations, a few opinions about our second century. Um, let me kick this off with a little, uh, a fun little video. See if I can make this thing work. So that's uh, one of the products that uh, we've, we've done for um, 2016, and um, I'm going to have a few more before this is over. So when I came on in 2009 as the 18th director and was sworn in, um, there were a few things about the service that I think were concerning uh, to me, probably to all of us. Visitation had been flat for at least a decade, um, and visitation in the U.S. National Park System uh, did not reflect the ethnic diversity of our nation. Um, our workforce um, also, particularly the seasonal workforce, did not reflect 
the diversity of our nation. The inventory of historic sites and parks and monuments and landmarks really did not reflect the contributions of minorities or women. And from a budgetary standpoint, we had been on basically on a steady decline for more uh, than a decade um, until we got a little bump in 2009 for our centennial seasonals. The Park Service had a history of being sort of the bastion of bipartisan support, uh, but all of a sudden we were getting lumped in with you know, big bad government and sort of getting bashed uh, as wasteful and inefficient. Um, the voices of the environmental groups that had at, at one time uh, been very successful at lobbying on our behalf, their voices had become shrill and uh, often ignored and resented um, by the U.S. Congress. And there was an increasing call to turn over parks and public lands to states and local governments, and certainly the state parks across our system were under siege uh, from a variety of fronts, including their own budgetary cuts as well. Climate change was uh, really imp impacting parks, and we were seeing it on the ground, but no one was really willing to talk about it uh, in public because of political fallout. And while the mission orientation of the employees was high, morale was particularly low in the National Park Service. And I asked uh, organizational consultant Meg Wheatley about that, and she interpreted this as a workforce that was disappointed and frustrated that they could not achieve their mission, the mission of the service. So I, coming on in 2009, decided that the centennial was an opportunity to sort of address all of these issues in some holistic manner. Now, I am a student of Park Service history, uh, like probably many of you, of conservation and preservation in the United States. And there's some great lessons there for us to look back on and draw from as we enter the centennial. Stephen Mather, our first director, said that our parks are not only show places and vacation lands, but vast schools of Americanism where people are studying, enjoying, and learning to love more deeply this land in which we live. Mather was really the first, I think, to understand that we needed deep and broad public support. Uh, if we didn't have it, the Park Service would never really get started. And in 1916, he had to build that from ground zero. He was a, he was a marketing guy, um, and he used artists and the National Geographic Society and to really show off the beauty of the national parks. He led the Mather Mountain Party and, and he built the ranger uh, image, the persona, the culture, uh, the uniform, uh, even our military style organization um, as a brand uh, and was extraordinarily successful at building that early constituency. His successor, Horace Albright, um, the second director expanded the national park system uh, in a brilliant move, adding all of the battlefield sites across the nation. And in that moment, uh, created a whole new constituency for, from our veterans and their families for the National Park Service. The other thing that Albright understood was that Congress would never have enough money for us, and so he began the real concept of patriotic philanthropy. He and John D. Rockefeller wrote each other 1,400 letters uh, in Albright's tenure, um, every one of them Albright asking for money. Um, and, um, and for example, he took uh, John D. Rockefeller to the Jackson Valley, Jackson Hole Valley, and encouraged him to begin quietly buying up ranches, which ultimately resulted in Franklin Delano Roosevelt using the Antiquities Act to expand Grand Teton National Park. And then came World War II, and most of the national parks were closed, uh, somewhat neglected. And in 1953, uh, Bernard DeVoto, a, a great writer of the time, wrote <clears throat> an article in Harper's Weekly that said, let's close the national parks. Let me read you a clip from this 1953 article. The deterioration of roads and plants that began with the war years when proper maintenance was impossible, has been accelerated by the enormous increase in visitors, by the shrinkage of staffs, and by the miserly appropriations that have prevented both repair and expansion of facilities. The National Park Service 
He is like the figure of American legendary, the widow who scrapes and patches and ekes out, who by desperate expedience succeeds in bringing up her children to be a credit to their culture. The National Park Service's general efficiency, the astonishingly good condition of its areas, its success at improvising and patching up is just short of miraculous. So um, <clears throat> that article stimulated Connie Wirth and George Hartzog, two directors to launch Mission 66. Who remembers see the USA in your Chevrolet? There's the demographic right there. Um, <clears throat> We invited the returning World War II veterans to come see their country. They came in droves. They brought their, the boomers, their kids, in the back seats of those cars. And we received in that period about a billion dollar increase to our budget. George Hartzog also launched Summer in the Parks program, expanded the inventory to urban areas like Gateway and Golden Gate, and our national seashores like Cape Hatteras, this time bringing parks to the people to connect to that urban dweller. So, and a piece that we sometimes forget that this initiative, Mission 66, which invited all these folks to come and see their country, resulted in the most robust period of environmental legislation in our history. Between 1964 and about 1972, the Wilderness Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Land and Water Conservation Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Wild and R Scenic Rivers Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Clean Air Act, and Earth Day all happened in that 64 to 72. Really the, the high watermark of conservation for our nation. And it is those foundational laws that are in place that have allowed us in the U.S. to protect our national parks against multiple threats for the last 50 years. And that period also built the current constituency for our local, our state parks, our public lands, and really most of the conservation and preservation organizations that exist today. That demographic is also the National Park visitors and our supporters, and it is a direct result of that marketing effort of Mission 66. Now that demographic, those boomers, are like me. We're getting older and stupider, and, and we're going in for the long dirt nap pretty soon. <laughs> that generation, my generation, is being replaced by the millennials. That 18 to 35 year old, urban, diverse, technologically addicted generation that is less connected than any generation in history to the outdoors. Now what if the millennials don't care? What if they don't care about national parks because they've had no contact? They've had no transformative experience. They did not know these places even existed, or they thought they were off limits to people of their skin color, or they thought that their stories were not being told or not being reflected within the places within our management. And the answer is if the millennials don't care, all those indicators that I mentioned when I came on before will just accelerate. Now, I know some of you out there um, who live and breathe ranger operations may see this a little differently, that perhaps we already have too many people or that we have people behaving badly, like putting chilly baby bisons in the back of their car, <laughs> walking off boardwalks, or you have half the staff or less that you had a decade ago. And you probably wonder, why is this director still just not just getting us more money and letting us hire more people and stop wasting their time on this centennial thingy. Um, well, you know, and I was in Rocky here last year for, the, for the, uh, their centennial celebration, and uh, I went out with Vaughn and the senior staff and, uh, for a, a little cookout and a couple of beers, and after a couple of beers, one of, one of the senior staff said, hey, director, you know this find your park thing? Our motto is find another park. <laughs> this one's full. <laughs> So your problems are real, I, I have no doubt about that. Um, and their resolution is part of the strategy. The Organic Act of the, of the National Park Service has these operative words, in such manner and by such means, as will leave them unimpaired. We like to focus on the unimpaired part, I like to focus on the manner and means. And the 
Centennial of 2016, this is the manner and means by which we'll leave these places unimpaired for future generations. All of you know Wallace Stegner called the National Parks America's best idea, the geography of hope. Hope's not a strategy, by the way. You need a strategy. So I'm gonna kind of click down what I consider the list of our centennial strategy. First was the call to action. Um, essentially an opportunity to align the field around a, a set of very specific actions. And the field in the National Park Service has responded quite well. And we have field rangers actively engaged and aligned around these few goals. Civil War to Civil Rights. We had this opportunity, the coincidence of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War and the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement. And it was a perfect opportunity to align these two parts of American history in a way that we interpret the Civil War and shift history's interpretation of the Civil War away from state rights and to slavery. And to connect it right to the Civil Rights Movement of 50 years ago, right to the civil rights issues that we are dealing with today in this country in places like Ferguson, Missouri. This focus brought new relevancy to, the, to not only the parks, but the stories that are told as well. And we focused on minority activity within the Civil War, the, the roles of Latinos and Asian Americans and African Americans and Native Americans as well. We launched a few theme studies to look at where are the gaps in the system um, in the American narrative, the contributions of Latinos, of women, of Asian American and Pacific Islanders, and LGBT, seeking out both place and story uh, to fill in those gaps. And we have been adding new sites like Stonewall Inn, the murals of Diego Rivera, and the workshops of Japanese American George Nakashimi. We've written a new plan for the national park system about the growth of the system and how to fill in both those ecological and historical gaps as well. We wanted to take control of our future instead of leaving it entirely up to Congress. And we've added new parks already to the system, really focused on filling in those gaps since I've been the director. We've added parks for Cesar Chavez, Harriet Tubman, Pullman, Fort Monroe, Hana Uliuli, Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers, Patterson Great Falls, the Manhattan Project, and Port Chicago. And each of these new additions expands the base of support for the National Park Service. And every one of them, so far, has come with a significant financial partner so that the burden on the National Park Service is, is minimized. The second century of the National Park Service is gonna be all about mutually respectful partnerships. And we listened to constructive criticisms in our partnership work and have revised Director's Order 21, giving a new policy framework for the partnership culture. One of those partners is the National Park Foundation. And let's just say their, our philanthropic partner, at the NPF, has not lived up to its, let's say, its potential um, in the past. But this is a different foundation. This is not the one that you probably grew up with. Uh, today, they are producing extraordinary results. They're well on their way to raising $350 million in their capital campaign. And they have stepped into the fray uh, to help us restore Drake's Estero at Point Reyes with $2 million, to raise $23 million to buy, help us buy the state school lands at Grand Teton, and millions to support the Every Kid in a Park as, as well. They also funded the Find Your Park campaign. And really, this is our first marketing campaign to the American people since Mission 66. And it's designed specifically towards the millennials to actively engage public in visitation, in stewardship, advocacy, and volunteerism. And we are seeing results already. The Find Your Park campaign has really reached uh, an extraordinary level. We have our honorary co-chairs with Michelle Obama and Laura Bush. We have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of social media postings, and we just passed seven billion impressions. And I have no idea what that means, but they say it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> our focus on youth and youth organizations, Nature Bridge, SCA, uh, Outdoor Alliance for Kids, Outdoor Afro, 
our Hope Cruise, alternative spring breaks. We are actively engaging young people, and particularly young people of color, in the outdoors and in preservation. This is the new farm team, um, exposing young people uh, from across all sectors to consider being a ranger uh, as a career. In the education space, we are working directly with the Department of Education, the National Geographic Society, uh, and real thought leaders. And we've evaluated um, our education materials, our Teacher Ranger Teacher Program, we've launched a curriculum portal, and frankly, are on the path to change public education in this nation through the utilization of places uh, and stories um, that we manage. The millennial generation is gonna be dealing with climate change for their entire lives. And I have two millennial kids, and I know that they will be dealing with this for their entire lives. And this has loomed over my 40 years, and I have seen many cases of ecological integrity being threatened and cultural resources being lost along our, our coastlines. And so we are developing new policies to really help us understand how to go into this sort of uncharted waters. And we've engaged Nobel laureates and other scholars to help us rewrite those policies. You know, we still, even though we have climate change threatening many of our parks, we can't stand back. And we've been taking on some major conservation decisions. And in many ways, by doing that, we send a message to this next generation that we're willing to do the fights. The fights for the Merced River Plan in Yosemite or Cape Hatteras uh, off highway vehicle driving, the Point Reyes oyster farming, winter use in Yellowstone, the Tamiami Trail bridging in the Everglades, Biscayne's Marine Reserve, the oil and gas regulations in, in national parks, or even hunting regulations in Alaska. Knocking these down, these, some of these that have been going on for a decade or multiple decades gives us strong credibility going into our second century. When we engaged uh, Gray Advertising as our sort of marketing firm, they did about a year's worth of research. And what they came out with right away is that the Park Service has a very strong brand, but we don't manage our brand that we do a lot of things that people have no idea that it is the National Park Service. So one of the initiatives is a one NPS, that all of the things we do, whether it's preservation tax credits or rivers and trails conservation assistance or land and water conservation fund, they all need to be branded as the National Park Service. Somewhat riffing off of what George Hartzog did in the urban space, we are really focused a lot on our urban parks, also on our role in the urban environment, and we've launched 10 urban fellows out into complicated cities like Detroit and Chicago and Richmond, California to connect people where they live. Another initiative, which some of you may know, <clears throat> uh, which I think is very exciting, is our outreach to people's desire to be healthy and that the role that parks and public lands play in public health. So we went to our one of our longest standing partnerships, the Public Health Service, and gave them a new charge to use parks and public lands as a public health resource, an antidote to cancer and heart disease and depression and um, obesity. And we now have 150 pilot uh, projects across the nation, and I have to say to my Aussie brothers out there, we stole this from you, um, and uh, you know, Mark Stone at Parks Victoria, and, and Bill Jackson have really been the, the international leaders on this. We brought it to the U.S. and have, have adopted it, uh, it to, to meet our standards. And uh, there's some really fantastic stuff going on in this space. I have to say one of the areas that I'm probably the most disappointed in uh, in this centennial uh, continues to be the U.S. Congress. Um, uh, with, on the 50th anniversary, as I mentioned, of landmark legislation like the Land and Water Conservation Fund and the Historic Preservation Fund, Congress allowed both of them to expire. Uh, in spite of heroic efforts by Secretary Jewell and the conservation preservation community and the outdoor industry, um, we did get uh, the largest budget in our history in 2016, and we have a very robust budget for 17, and we have a centennial legislative package uh, before Congress that is attached to the energy bill uh, and we have some good signs that we may be turning the tide, uh, but there is such a, 
uh, a negative sort of atmosphere in the U.S. Congress, uh, it uh, it's still continues to be a challenge, and we need, we need to restore the kind of bipartisan respect that they, they had at one time uh, for the National Park Service. On the international front, we are back on the international stage, um, something that's been very important to me, uh, working with park systems across the nation, uh, leading the IUCN efforts on climate change adaptation, on women in developing countries, leading conservation efforts, and we're actively engaged in co-hosting the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii in September of 2016. And at that conference, we will unveil a project that we've been working with Canada and Mexico around looking at uh, the state of conservation on the North American continent. Um, and I, again, I want to welcome all of our international rangers that are here. You're all part of our family. A year or so ago, um, I'll give you an example of what I think sort of the new national parks in our new centennial, our second century will be all about. It was the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, and we did something a little different this time. We welcomed Americans from every stripe to come and participate. College students and retirees, working mothers and stay-at-home dads, civil rights attorneys, gay couples seeking marriage, and teenagers from Little Rock, Arkansas, or Ferguson, Missouri. And we let them march along that 65 miles from Selma to Montgomery along the same path that Dr. Martin Luther King did in 1965. And along that march, they talked and they shared lessons and they taught each other. And our rangers' role was to basically keep them safe. But they also offered an open ear. And instead of us trying to be an authority, we listened uh, to these young people in this nation to tell them, to tell us about their own struggles for civil rights. And I had an opportunity to meet with some of these young folks on their way down, and then I've met with them several times since uh, their return. And these kids will never, ever be the same. Uh, in many ways, neither will we. A couple more stories. So last year, I was the keynote speaker at the Greater and Greener Conference in, in San Francisco. That's a gathering of sort of urban park professionals. We had about 75 of our own urban rangers there from places like Golden Gate and Gateway and the Statue of Liberty. And the speaker just before me was uh, a, a really good speaker. I've heard him before. And he, he loves to use these sort of metaphorical analogies. And he was making a particular point, which I don't remember what the point was, but uh, he was using the story of rain in Death Valley National Park. We were in California, so I guess that's okay. He said, 10 years ago, it had rained hard in the spring, and the desert in Death Valley had exploded in bloom. And he emphasized that this was a surprise, that no one knew this would happen, that these seeds lay dormant, and when the rain, they sprouted. No one knew, he kept saying. Well, I was up next. <laughs> so I got up. And I said, well, in all due respect, we knew. Of course we knew the desert was going to bloom because we're rangers and we know stuff. And we know... <laughs> we know that our centennial goal to connect with and create the next generation of park visitors and supporters and advocates will be successful because regardless of how ethnically diverse, distracted, urban, and technologically addicted this next generation will be, we still have something to offer them that they cannot get anywhere else. One more story. There was a young man who was participating in one of these youth experiences at Grand Teton, and it was his first time there. In many ways, he represents this sort of emerging population of the United States, diverse, inexperienced in, in wild places. The, the park, of course, had loaned this kid, along with others, uh, bicycles to, to get to work each morning, and he was riding his bicycle along and looking up at the Tetons in a, in a Teton sunrise, which I'm sure many of you have experienced. And he literally broke into tears um, because this was an experience that he thought that he would never have. And that life was changed in that, in that moment. The Park Service did not create the Teton Mountains, no, nor the Statue of Liberty or Rocky. But we rangers will continue to fight for their protection 
as national parks so that every American now and in future generations can stand shoulder to shoulder equally with their fellow citizens and have that moment of emotional discovery about their country and themselves. And as through that discovery, they will grow to become contributing citizens steeped in the values that make this nation great. And they will remember that that light came on in a national park protected by and provided for their enjoyment by the extraordinary park rangers in this room. So let me show you one more quick little video. Yeah, we're beautiful. America's best idea. The greatest of America's natural landscapes our revered cultural heritage, and our most important historical lessons. A mosaic of what we Americans value about our places, ourselves, and each other. We serve as guardians of many of our nation's greatest treasures, and the tellers of our collective stories. We honor the best of who we are as a nation and seek lessons in our country's imperfections. Our role is not to define for others, but to inspire discovery, to question our assumptions, to uphold our nation's democratic principles, and to challenge each other to rise above what was and achieve the ideal of what can be. So, who are we, and what do we believe about ourselves? Ours are the faces of many peoples, the bearers of many identities. We are public servants, fiercely dedicated public servants, and we believe in the power of our mission. We see how our work connects to the greater good. We are passionate about what we do, we are courageous. We welcome challenges. We strive to create opportunities for everyone to connect with their parks. We support local communities. We are stewards. We are family. We are ambassadors. We are all of this because we believe that we did not inherit, but we borrow from our future. Yeah, we are beautiful. America's best idea. But is believing in who we are enough? Are we connecting with the next generation? Do we learn from our own diversity? Have we truly ensured that all people feel invited, included, and engaged? Can we risk not meeting the needs of an increasingly diverse America? To be America's best, we need to go out and invite new audiences. Share the difficult stories. Meet the needs of an ever-evolving society. Confront our discomfort realize that many people value our mission as much as we do. Harness the power of our own diversity. Seek opinions different than our own. Really listen. Be willing to implement new ideas. Be flexible. Build meaningful connections with others. And embrace change as an opportunity to learn and grow. 
Relevancy, diversity, and inclusion are pillars. They are values and practices for connecting the public to our mission and fulfilling our obligation to steward our nation's natural and cultural heritage. Discussing and debating these values embodies our democratic ideals and strengthens our role in society. Listen, share, join in the discussion. We're all in this together. We are the National Park Service. Okay, I think we're going to take some questions now. So, how, how much time, Meg? About 10 minutes. So, it's fair game. Oh, come on. <laughs> Here's the mic. Yeah, go up. Yeah, so go to the mic if you got a question. Comment. Complaint. <laughs> Just co go to the mic and line up if you've got a question. <clears throat> that way the translators can get it. G'day. Um, Pete Cleary from Southern Australia, Phillip Island. Um, the one question that I had was that... <laughs> How do, how do people, as you explained, actually don't feel like that the parks are part of their, uh, the landscape for them? I don't understand how these people are actually feeling like they're disconnected from parks just um, as a part of their, the way they live. How, how is that come into the landscape? I, well, <clears throat> I think um, part of it is a, a legacy issue in the United States of overt racism. Um, if you know your history in this nation, um, the for you know we had a civil war. Uh, we had uh, killed more people uh, than all the rest of the wars of our own uh, combined. Uh, there was a period of Reconstruction and Jim Crow uh, laws. I'm speaking specifically to the African American community. Um, and in the turn, early part of the century, um, African-American citizens of our nation were not allowed uh, to, um, to visit national parks. Uh, they were segregated. Um, and um, historical patterns of tourism by the African-American community resulted in parks not being part of their, their experience. Um, I'm painting a fairly broad brush. I'm not saying that's completely across all uh, of those, but that's very much the case. And so we have to re-invite uh, uh, segments of our society that have been disenfranchised from their parks and their public lands to say these do belong to you and you are welcome and we do want you to come. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think there's a, there's a whole generation uh, in the United States of new citizens uh, who have come from parts of the world where there were no public lands, there were no parks, and they, they, they were exclusively available to the royal or to the rich. And again, introducing uh, new American citizens to these places is also critical as well. And that's one reason we run a lot of um, naturalization ceremonies uh, in national parks as well. So, um, and I think there's even in somewhat of an attitude amongst the young millennials uh, that national parks were a thing of their parents. And I'm doing it, I'm visiting the Grand Canyon on my iPhone rather than actually going, so. Yes, yes sir. Gracias, buenos días, Gracias. soy de Perú. Mi nombre es Bildoso Sangama Guerra. Real, realmente me da gusto escucharlos como a escala planetaria los guardaparques venimos este, cautelando los recursos naturales que están en peligro. Eh, solamente para agregarlas. My name is um, Bildoso Sangamari, Sangama Guerra, and I'm from Peru. And I'm really excited about how you brought up the fact that we, as 
Rain, as park rangers are, in fact, you know, instrumental in conservation and pre preservation of resources. Sí, este, pero en realidad preocupa no solamente a los guardaparques, debe preocupar a los estados para conservar los recursos naturales, porque este, las explotaciones mineras en el mundo entero se dan a tajo abierto y los guardaparques nos enfrentamos a las amenazas. Eh, como ejemplo, le pongo en Perú, ahora mismo se ha, de, se ha declarado en zona de emergencia eh, una de las áreas naturales protegidas de Perú, Tambopata. Y quienes han puesto en amenaza a esa área natural protegida son los mineros ilegales. Y en ello yo quiero ser enfático y decirlos a ustedes para que sepan ahora en este congreso de escala planetaria de que son aquellos que compran el oro ahí en el sector las que impulsan los trabajos ilegales quienes contaminan el medio ambiente. And what I would now want to share, though, what's really it's something that the states need to be concerned about conservation because right now, what we feel ourselves with great threats of right now in Peru is open pit mining. Open pit mining, and in fact, right now there is actually threats against us, and there is actually a state of emergency in. In Tambo, in Tambo Patal, and this is due to illegal mining. And I want to ask each and every one of you to take this into consideration that this on a planetary scale is what's happening. And it's from the ore mining that's coming from these mines that's really endangering these resources for us. Entonces, quiero terminar finalmente llamándonos a, ref llamándonos a reflexionar todos nosotros y decirlo al mundo entero, no más contaminación ambiental en forma irresponsable. Porque son aquellas tortugas acuáticas allá en el río Tambopata las que están sufriendo. Son los tapires ahí en Tambopata las que están quedando sin hábitat porque está quedando terrenos desérticos. Y todas las plantas que los hombres, las personas se alimentan ahí, están contaminados de mercurio. Eso es el reto de los guardaparques, eso debe de salir hoy día en la memoria de ustedes, cómo el eh, dinero, eh, la ambición al dinero se viene apropiándose de esa manera para degradar a la naturaleza y a la especie humana. Gracias. Gracias. And I would like to finally want each and every one of us as a world to reflect upon the fa fact that irresponsible mining of resources is causing irreversible damage in these areas of Entacumpatal. Our, the sea turtles are, are being affected by this. Our tapiras are being affected. The people who live there are being affected because of the mercury that's spilling into the groundwater and is affecting the vegetation. So I want to leave us with, the, with that. Uh, thank you. Um, and I would say that there's probably every park system in the country, including the U.S., uh, have these kinds of issues. Um, and only as a world community, uh, the World Conservation Congress, which is coming up in Hawaii in September, uh, but, the, but the rangers are on the front lines. Um, you have the most knowledge uh, of these issues and the ability to communicate it, as you have done, uh, to, uh, to the world. And um, that is a critical component to resolution. And only as a world community can we figure out ways to uh, prevent this kind of, of destruction uh, to the environment. And, you know, that my focus on the next generation is because we are borrowing it from them. Uh, and we have to get them engaged uh, in order for uh, this planet to really um, be sustainable into the future. Over to this mic now, and then we'll come back to this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director, my name is Jay Lepke. I work for Parks Canada. Um, <clears throat> You alluded to low morale in the, in the Park Service, and in, during the Congress here, there's been lots of discussions about uh, working conditions for uh, rangers all over the world. But even in speaking with some of my uh, U.S. National Park Service uh, you know, colleagues here, I was, uh, 
I was surprised at some of the challenges they have as far as some of their working conditions, as far as like uh, seasonal work, contract, uh, contract to contract, uh, low job security, uh, and, and things like that. And so I'm not suggesting that Parks Canada is different in many regards. We also eat our own young. That's the expression that we would use. But I'm wondering going forward into the next century of uh, the National Park Service in the U.S., if there's any considerations as far as how you manage human resources of field personnel at the lowest level. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things. Um, I think you probably most of you know we were able to achieve a new direct hiring authority for seasonals that can non-competitively uh, be hired directly into the National Park Service. And that was a, a long fought battle, but we finally achieved it through Congress and uh, and have the regulations in place now with, uh, with OPM. So you work two years as a seasonal, you have non-competitive status and can be hired directly into the National Park Service. <laughs> Throughout time, um, we got seasonal uh, health insurance available now as well. So, you know, we've been knocking down these one at a time to provide better, better working conditions uh, in the service. And I do think we're gonna have probably one of the largest retirements uh, probably in the in the history of the service uh, as we go into the centennial. I think a lot of people have been hanging on uh, for a long time and are going to go out. And so there should be a huge opportunity uh, to move into the system as, as the cohort moves up uh, in the system. Um, you know, in many ways, working conditions boil down to money. Um, and we have been uh, uh, in decline from a funding standpoint for a long time. And you know, once you sort of understand what, uh, not that you, I, I like it, but I understand it, uh, the, the, how Congress views the appropriations of the National Park Service, um, you know, they have many mouths to feed. Um, and we have not been very good at making our case uh, of why the Park Service deserves more money uh, to pay for uh, the work of the National Park Service. And we've been inarticulate, to be blunt about it. We just think they ought to give us the money because we do such great work. It doesn't work like that. You have to be much more uh, precise. And so we are in the process of breaking out the um, recreation economy in the nation. The recreation economy, by the way, which we're in the process of breaking out within, within the Bureau of Economic Analysis, is outdoor recreation in contributions to the nation is double, or at least double, what the oil and gas industry provides to this nation in terms of jobs. Yet we've never actually articulated that, you know, to Congress, that an investment in the work that we do generates far more jobs than the, all of the subsidies and things that they do for the oil and gas industry. Um, and, um, and so really making the economic argument uh, to the U.S. Congress so that they give us the money so that I can improve park housing, hiring, you know, insurance, uh, you know, backfill jobs and give parks the operational budgets that they really deserve uh, in the future is really critical, I think, uh, to, to uh, the morale of the National Park Service employees. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jewel Johnson. I'm from Los Angeles. I work for a small park agency called the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. We pretty much build parks in the urban interface. And speaking to diversity, as we probably know as park rangers, you do get your experience about your love of the nature in your childhood. So we have our Earth Adventure camps and we have to get to kids. And it really comes down to, when I say access, literal access, we need a bus to get them to the park. We built a park at the middle of in Compton and Slauson. We made it look like the Santa Monica Mountains, and then we provided bus rides to the actual thing every Saturday. And it's stuff simple as that, that the National Park Service, where again, most people get their experience parks, is local parks, county parks. That's where people in the cities get their experience. I always call myself the accidental ranger. You know, I didn't plan on being a ranger, you know. But when I got the opportunity, I, it was, I found it interesting. So when I talk to kids, it's like they're very scared when they come to the park. 
even though the park is less than 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from their house. They see it as they drive the freeways in Los Angeles, but they had no experience with that. But and as MPS, I think it's important because you guys are kind of the brand in this country that when you talk about rangers, you think about National Park Service. The, use your influence and um, your voice to you know, speak to the nation about also your current rangers to get more involved with organizations like the International Ranger Federation. I always want to see more current rangers come to these, these, um, these uh, events because the resources are here that we can help our, our rangers around the world. But we need it to come from the top. They need to hear it from you in writing and, and verbally, whatever you want to do, to tell them, please get involved with the International Ranger Federation to bring the resources from the National Park Service to this organization. Because that's what, we're, that's what they're needing. They need resources. It's good that we have militaries that are training the rangers around the world, but we have resources in the Park Service, game wardens, that can also bring that, their training and their experience that's needed. So, but we need it from the top. Got it, got it. Thank you for what you're doing with young kids uh, in the LA area. Um, I think most of you know about the Every Kid in a Park program uh, where we have targeted to uh, give every fourth grader in the nation a park field trip and we are raising the money privately uh, to fund that. Um, and we, our goal here, of course, is to do this every year uh, for the next 12 years so that every child uh, in the nation will have had a park experience. And the money is specifically to provide that school bus uh, and support. Um, and it's really, it's roughly $10 a kid. I mean, that's an incredible investment uh, in connecting these kids uh, to local parks uh, and to the national parks as well. But thank you. Yes, sir. Morning, my name is Gonzalo. I came from Chile, South America. I'm park ranger from Torres del Paine National Park. And I want to, if you would share with us, I have a question for you. Uh, what is the most remarkable thing as a park ranger's career in your uh, 40 years? And what is the worst? <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Um, well, I would say, um, um, you know, that's hard to pick in terms of the most sort of remarkable things. Um, I've had extraordinary experiences in the national parks in my career. You know, I worked uh, Guadalupe Mountains, Crater Lake, North Cascades, Wrangell St. Elias. I think one of the early on when I was, uh, I was the Frijoli, the Bean Ranger, uh, at uh, Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas, um, a group of paraplegics came uh, to, uh, to climb uh, Guadalupe Peak in their wheelchairs. Uh, there were uh, uh, about seven of them. Uh, five started up the mountain. Three uh, made it to the summit. Uh, uh, two of them were, were spinal injury uh, sports, and, and one had lost both legs in Vietnam. Uh, and um, I spent every day with them for over, over five days as they, uh, they climbed the mountain in their wheelchairs. Uh, basically dragging their wheelchairs behind them because the, this is not an ADA handicapped accessible trail. <laughs> this is a you know steep uh, sided drop off uh, you know 5,000 foot gain um, mountain trail. Uh, and to watch them work as a team uh, to be inspired what a national park can do. Uh, they they still get together. I'm still in contact with them. Uh, incredible incredible individuals. Uh, on the downside, uh, most of those have occurred since I've been director. Um, um, if you remember, we had a little, uh, a little government shutdown um, and, uh, for 16 days, and um, I was the only, um, only uh, official from the administration that testified before Congress. I sat before the combined House Oversight and House Natural Resources Committee uh, and uh, for five hours and 12 minutes, which they did not allow me to go to the bathroom, um, and, um, and was grilled uh, about uh, why we uh, did what we did, uh, being basically blamed for the government shutdown. Uh, what was, uh, there were 35,000 articles on the national parks in 16 days. Uh, we were on nightly news every night. 
uh, and ultimately uh, the government was restarted. The Park Service was the face uh, of the government shutdown, and uh, we took a bit of heat. That was a that was a rough patch, but it is what it is. Goes with the territory. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I'm Rodney Chambers from Christchurch, New Zealand. I just wanted to congratulate you on your work and con congratulate you on this uh, anniversary time. And for those of us on the outer rim, we look to you as a great example. And I just want to thank you for your recent outreach to communities, to taking the risk. And uh, it seems a very reactionary country and, and the risk is great and we appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. I have to, I have to tell you, uh, I've had in the last um, couple of weeks, I've done two public meetings, um, which you might put into that risk category. Um, one was in Maine. Uh, I did four public meetings in Maine uh, related to the potential new uh, National Park unit uh, adjacent to Baxter, uh, the 87,500 acres that are being proposed to donate to the National Park Service to create a new park unit uh, in Maine. And, um, and um, locally, a lot of opposition, statewide, a lot of support and uh, a fascinating. Uh, uh, my favorite line of that public meeting, uh, in which I had 1,200 people in one of them, uh, but there was one meeting which was totally opposed um, this Mainer got up, and I was with Senator Angus King. He's the state senator, or the, the congressman from there. And uh, this old Mainer got up and he said, Senator King, give Director Jarvis a lobster and send him home. <laughs> um, and then we did a, uh, another public meeting in, uh, in New York uh, at Stonewall Inn, which is really the, the site of the essentially the uprising that resulted in, in the gay rights movement, sort of the, the primary uh, site that really turned uh, the way uh, this nation has embraced um, uh, the recognition of the LGBT community. And it was a really great meeting, complete uh, unanimity and support. It would be our first National Park unit established uh, to tell the story of the gay rights movement. So uh, really fantastic uh, there. So we're, we're definitely, uh, uh, breaking some new ground. Go ahead. I just want to offer the, are we on here? We've got time for one more, and I think Director Jarvis will be here during the, the break. And if they can't translate. It doesn't, okay, here we go. So we've got time for one more. I think there was someone over here at this microphone, and then we'll move on to our next speaker, but Director Jarvis will continue to be here, and you can approach him with questions individually. Okay. Bueno, eh, mi nombre es Paola Evia de Colombia. Soy un poco disfónica. <coughs> mi aporte en esto, me gustaría que el, el video que colocaron de, de los guardaparques eh, pudieran incluir los guardaparques de todo el mundo. Creo que eso ayudaría mm, a poder mm, que la, las personas del común que no conocen qué, qué es lo que hacemos, se sensibilizarán un poco más y esto podría ayudar un poco más a, a sumar a muchos a esta causa. My name is Jenny Devia, Paola Devia, <coughs> and I'm from Colombia. And my contribution to this um, conversation is when you have that um, video that shows the park, all the par different park rangers, maybe if you were able to to include the park rangers from all the world, then maybe that would help sensitize it and make people aware of what we do everywhere. I think that's, uh, that's a great idea. Sin embargo, para el tema en Colombia, estamos en el proceso de paz, ¿sí? Y hace poco salen noticias del gobierno nacional donde parte de las eh, personas desmovilizadas del conflicto armado van a ser parte del, del integrarlos a la vida civil. 
y entre esas integración de la vida civil está poder que ellos hagan parte de ser guardabosques, guardaparques. ¿Cómo cree usted que podría esto, o sea, esto que estamos haciendo en este Congreso, apoyar a Colombia, eh, ya que los guardaparques eh, deben de tener esa mística, eh, ese don de servicio, esa, um, ese apoyo incondicional de, de una causa de conservación? ¿sí? Eh, y pues esa preparación de estas personas eh, eh, que hacen parte eh, de volverse en, eh, parte completa de la sociedad colombiana, ¿cómo podría empezar a moverse o apoyar esa, esa, um, ese ejercicio de liderazgo en, en las áreas? Well, part of what... <laughs> So another thing, just referring specifically to Colombia now, part of what's happening is that people have been demobilized from our conflict that's been going on in our country. They're trying to reintegrate them into society by putting them within the, the park ranger system. And so how can you, all of us, support Colombia as a country in, in helping instill in these new recruits well, that certain mystic that one needs to be a ranger, that certain sense of service to others, unconditional support of conservation and preservation. So how can we help them with giving them the due preparation to integrate them into this cause? So that's my, what I would pose to our general community to give us help in. It's a great question, and uh, please say hello to Julia Miranda for me. Uh, she's a very good friend um, and has been a great uh, ally uh, with uh, our work. Um, I think that your point about ingraining the culture of service early on, uh, many, I think, are drawn to this role as rangers because of that. They already have it, but not in all cases. Um, that uh, you need to infuse it. And so in the US national park system, within the first five years of their work, we put them through uh, a pretty robust training program. But I think ultimately it comes down to sort of mentorship, is finding a mentor. And that could be an international mentor, and that's part of what this is all about, is creating that somebody that can mentor that young, new, ranger early on in their career so they get on the right path of, of service. And that's something that we can help facilitate. And, and, and in terms of that video, that was an in-house production by the National Park Service, yes. by uh, Matthew John, who is one of our videographers. <laughs> and I think that's something we could work with you to create an international uh, version of that video, if that's something you would like. So thank you very much. Take care. We'll see you.